Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I will be your moderator. We're very excited for today's webinar, titled Marine Connectivity Conservation Rules of Thumb for MPA and MPA Network Design, which will be presented by Barbara Lauschi and Mary Collins. Barbara Lauschi is an international environmental lawyer with more than 30 years advising on conservation law and policy in developing countries and internationally. Since 2010, she has served as director of the Marine Policy Institute Moat Laboratory in Florida and has begun an active and has been an active member of the WCEL and WCPA since the 1980s. In recent years, she, had, she has authored numerous IUCN publications on marine protected area law, policy, and connectivity. In 2019, she was appointed chair of the IUCN WCPA CCSP Marine Connectivity Working Group comprised of some 90 marine professionals worldwide. Prior positions have included senior environmental staff at the World Bank, World Wildlife Fund US, and numerous legal drafting cons consultancies in developing countries. Mary Collins is the International Program Conservation Associate at the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, where she engages at international levels, providing advisory services, technical assistance, and capacity building for policy advancements, on-the-ground connectivity implementation, and expert working groups, including the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Working Group and the Marine Connectivity Working Group. Mary is a climate, marine, and social scientist driving meaningful environmental and social value at scale through cooperative solutions. We are very excited to have both Mary and Barbara here today. Before I turn it over to Dr. Lashi, I would like to, to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your question in the questions box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, and we will pose the questions to Barbara and Mary at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Barbara. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. I want to welcome those of you that have joined us today, and uh, thank you for your interest in this subject. Uh, we hope that it will be um, informative for you as, as well as perhaps offering some new information that you might not have had before. Next slide. First slide. Here is our agenda. We are going to start with the basics on what is ecological connectivity. We then will move to the marine environment and marine connectivity, we will introduce the institutional mechanism that IUCN has uh, established, the Marine Connectivity Working Group, and our first major project, producing rules of thumb for how one designs connectivity into marine protected areas. Mary will pick it up then with some case examples. We will have a short section after that on policy, which is an important part of connectivity since policy needs to basically recognize, endorse, and in cases of law, is establish the requirement to look at connectivity. Finally, we will close on um, areas where you all can do more. Next slide. So let's start at the beginning. What is ecological connectivity? And there I want to highlight a, a publication that came out of IUCN last year. You will see there um, a large group of contributors. The importance of that publication is it's the first time we tried to articulate and give examples on connectivity conservation from an ecological point of view and from a network point of view. The website where you can download this document is at the bottom and just to highlight how popular it's become it is it is number one in the uh, IUCN publications that have been 
requested by uh, by members and the and other interested parties. Next slide, please. Definitions. That's key. That gets us started, and it gives us the foundation. Uh, ecological connectivity is now defined by the guidelines as the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on Earth. Natural processes are ecosystem services and functions, etc. Then, if we look at ecological connectivity for species, we have a definition that, again, is coming through the guidelines. The functional movement of populations, individuals, genes, gametes, and propagules between populations, communities, and ecosystems, as well as the structural connection of non-living material from one location to another. Then, of course, we frequently use and have defined more generally connectivity conservation to be efforts to try and restore um, degraded and fragmented areas that are important for biodiversity and build again links between critical habitats and eco ecological processes. Next slide, please. Here we have our shift to marine. And those of you that are marine practitioners and students of marine uh, subjects will recognize uh, right away that uh, the global ocean has several features that are unique and different from terrestrial areas. First of all, it covers most of the globe. It produces 50% of our oxygen. My boss at Moat says, if you breathe twice, one of those breaths is from ocean generated oxygen. It absorbs CO2, regulates our climate as, as we know in major ways, it is also a major food source. It contributes as part of the economy through food and other means, um, $1.5 trillion annually, and is biodiversity rich, very rich, with much still undiscovered. Next slide. So here we are. Um, connectivity is illustrated in many different ways, but the main two um, approaches that one should take to cover it properly is that it is going to come with a range from the mountaintop, or if we look at the top left picture, the ridge, to the reef that's coral reefs, then all of the um, interactions that that stream or underground water may have in between. It, if we look at the top right hand illustration, it also goes from coastal areas and near shore waters, shallow waters, to the deep sea. And the deep sea is not only out to the exclusive economic zone. It is the entire deep sea, which is what we're trying to show in that illustration. Then it also works through the life cycle of many um, species. Here in the bottom left, we have the um, a, a rather animated picture of the life cycle stages of the red snapper. And then on the bottom right, another caricature of the deep ocean and, and how uh, species and topography um, play an interactive role. Next slide, please. So let's talk about connectivity and MPA networks. 
for those of you working in the science of marine conservation, you will know that the kinds of interactions that are occurring to create connectivity function in the marine environment basically are related first to continuing connecting adjacent habitats. The second would be connecting through regular larval dispersal in the water. And we know now that some of this dispersal is maybe uh, a few feet and some maybe hundreds of miles. Uh, the regular settlement of the larva from one MPA to another, which then promotes the population stability and genetic variability. And then the movement of mature mar marine life uh, from one area to another, their home range, um, uh, the feeding range throughout their life cycle. And this is especially, of course, relevant for migratory species. Next slide, please. So here is a simple illustration of connectivity. It's showing, uh, in this case, currents and then a gyro in the center where probably we have a lot of plastics. This is the Gulf of Mexico. And you will see that the Gulf is not isolated. Um, connectivity functions move from outside the Gulf to the Straits of Florida, into the Gulf, and then back out to the Atlantic. Uh, next slide, please. And here's another uh, simple illustration, the larval dispersal. Um, that is a, a picture of the sort of snowflake um, uh, illustration of the larva as it's moving out. And you will see um, on the right, three different illustrations of how larva is moving in the Gulf, depending on the year. So there is a variety of, of circumstances with different species, and there is still a lot we do not know um, in terms of the, the intensity and the survivability of larva. This here shows the Flower Garden Banks, which is a national marine sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. So we know that the Convention on Biological Diversity has, uh, through its conference of parties and its membership, endorsed several ecological criteria for designing marine protected areas. And this is a joint effort with the Law of the Sea uh, people because we, we understand that the exclusive economic zone is just a political boundary. It's not a boundary of nature. So if you look here, you will see 14 ecological criteria and way at the bottom, but still there is connectivity. Now this, this this set of criteria came out uh, several years ago. So we should be very happy that it's there. Now, it isn't being used yet too much according to this research, but it's there and it is becoming much more prevalent in all of the international guidance. Next slide. Why marine connectivity? Well, we started to talk about it a little bit up above. We have the functional and structural structural functions. And, and we're talking about how to keep habitat connected and represented, how to have biodiversity, have both its genetic and its ecosystem functions connected. And we're also talking about resilience 
for climate change. Connectivity gives more flexibility to allow species and ecosystems to have a bit of margin if they're disturbed and they need to shift either for food or because currents change. So the resilience issue with climate change will become even more and more important. And then we have cross-boundary connectivity, which helps really countries work together and increase their collaboration. So we have a, between boundaries on the marine side, and we have boundaries inland because some of the interaction that reaches the coast may come through river systems that have many uh, paths through other countries. So national collaboration is key. Next slide, please. Now we have a slide with uh, one in my version, the unique is without the cue but that's just fine. A Q is a very unique <laughs> letter, so we can add it, and it makes this the slide even more stunning. Here we are talking about the, again, the unique features of the marine environment and how connectivity plays into this. And we start with uh, the three-dimensional, issue um, from surface to subsurface, vertical, horizontal, um, the entire interplay of the ocean uh, space. Lancy interactions, which I've already mentioned, high environmental variability. And this is, this is one of the areas where research is so important and is still so much emerging now. Then we're talking climate change, shifting habitats, acidification, which some of you already know and is being recorded, particularly having impact on some species, temperature warming, hypoxic conditions, uh, algae blooms, siltation, severe storms, and, and changing currents. All of these are in the basket of our climate change concerns. And then the knowledge gap. And depending on which literature you look at, you've got maybe only 20% uh, of the biodiversity recorded and maybe less. So these are the important areas. And our knowledge gaps in the marine environment are much greater than in the terrestrial environment. So we're moving along, but a little more slowly. Next slide, please. I put this here because we have goals that are internationally recognized, and in this case, led by the Convention on Biodiversity. Some of you may be familiar with the ACHI targets that were part of the biodiversity strategy uh, approved in 2010 for uh, achievement by 2020. And the ACHI Target 11 talks about percentage of protection of both the land and the sea. 17% uh, for the land, 10% for the coastal and sea. You will see then on the left above the global map that so far, we have about um, under 8%, but almost 8% of the seas protected. But critically, much of this is partial protection. Only about 3% are highly protected, which means no take zones. And we have to increase that. I think you, can now, you already know we, we almost made it with the terrestrial areas and their protection zones. Next slide, please. So what's going on in the ocean that is potentially beneficial and potentially harmful? 
well, let's talk about the harmful um, features that we need to deal with when we're working with connectivity. The first is overfishing. You will see from the top right slide of the globe, those red areas show overfishing up to 90% of the species that are commercially fished. Um, so we can call that unsustainable fishing at this point. The bottom left image shows us the marine traffic in the sea. So we understand a little bit now why whales keep getting into collisions. And there is a website where you can just watch this by the week. It's, it, it is, uh, incredibly dynamic and um, very relevant for marine for marine life and and the technology that is being out, that is out there right now that can help us understand connectivity and then on the bottom right we have the areas that are already um, relatively marked for deep seabed mining and that is uh, under the jurisdiction of the uh, the seabed, the International Seabed Authority. So these are these are inner, these are sort of global pressures that are hitting the ocean. Next slide. Now, some of our technology is helping us understand how those global pressures are affecting the marine life, especially in our ocean. And one of the ways that we are trying to track this, including at Moat, is through tagging of species. We can see on the upper left, the tagging of the whale shark, which starts in the Gulf and is, um, and we track until around Rio de Janeiro, so we call her the Rio Lady. The top right illustration is tagging uh, with a very new technology that, that we've now um, put together, which can measure uh, 12 millimeters long by 2.1 millimeters in diameter, tiny little seedling fish. And we're doing this with snook to see uh, where it goes and and how far um, out it is um, it travels before it is actually uh, caught. It is a very popular fishing um, uh, species. And the little wire tag at the bottom right um, sort of is what gets turned back into us when. Uh, fisher men and women uh, catch these fish. The middle bottom slide is tracking some migratory sea turtles. And you can see that that is not only continental, but global movement of species. Next slide. Zach, are you okay? Yes, did it not advance for you? Okay, um, super. I apologize, it seems to be a delay. Okay, um, this this is just a real quick slide. I'm gonna let let you look at that in your in your leisure of the kinds of technologies that are for the bigger picture: um, currents, acidity, turbidity. Um, temperature and these are helping us understand what's going on in the ocean that can feed into how we can best manage the ocean and protect the marine species and ecosystems that are that are functioning there these some of these go all the way down to the bottom the 11 miles or so okay um next slide please This is introducing us, moving on to our institutional framework, 
uh, the Marine Connectivity Working Group, which Zach mentioned uh, uh, was formed in 2019 with over 90 members in 20 plus countries. We are working um, mainly to try and deal with connecting critical habitats, helping species movement, and sustaining, restoring, and maintaining biodiversity and the function that are critical for them, including biodiversity in our key biodiversity areas. Next slide, please. And our four objectives are, of course, science, coordinating and monitoring and maintaining updates on science, planning, which is more of the applied side of marine connectivity and protected areas where we take the science and we work with it on the ground, governance and participation, which then focuses on the government agencies involved or communities, and then communication and technical outreach, which um, sort of covers all of these and, um, and is a, a key part of our working group effort. Uh, next slide. So we, as our first project, is as part of the Marine Connectivity Working Group, decided that we would dive into trying to uh, design rules of thumb for connectivity as it should be integrated into marine protected areas and networks. Now, why did we do this? We did this because scientists will tell us that if the science is very complicated and incomplete, as is the case here, apply general rules of thumb. So we went to several sources, including sources which then provided us with a lot of guidance on rules of thumb, and you will see those sources there, um, particularly um, the publication by Bulbard and Metasis of 2019, where they actually began to look at rules of thumb and whether they were being used in MPA planning. Next slide. So the rules of thumb, we, we appreciate that marine connectivity is relatively new, that science and technology are moving but still have a long way to go, that some tools are already available, that we need a mix of law and policy, that we need to use technology, as I mentioned before, and that we're already learning lessons. So what did we do last year? We produced a booklet, a publication, uh, on marine connectivity conservation rules of thumb. And this was uh, an iteration after several reviews and um, input from our working group. You will see the link at the bottom, which you might refer to after, uh, once you see these slides um, as part of the recording. And uh, we would highly suggest that you look at this um, because it does it does give background as well as the rules of thumb. Uh, next slide. Here are the rules of thumb. I'm not gonna read them, but they're for you, for your convenience later on. Next slide, please. Now we did shortcut sort of phrasing for the 13 rules of thumb. And I will just mention Three, the first, ecological connectivity should always be considered. Second, one must more than ever before look at climate change as it is currently impacting the marine environment and anticipated impacts. Climate change is going to be a big driver for many things we do and connectivity is going to be a big instrument for adaptation. 
And then the, the last one I would like to point out is number 11, habitat suitability and predictive modeling. We don't know enough in many cases in most parts of the ocean. And this is where habitat modeling becomes so important. And we go with what we've got, we can improve it later on, but we start now so that we still have something to save. The next slide, please. Sorry. Now I just want to turn it over to um, to my colleague, Mary Collins, who will talk about application. Thanks, Barb. And hi, all for. Uh, thanks for joining today. I'm Mary, and I'm going to talk a little more in depth about on the ground applications concerning these rules of thumb that Barb's just gone through with us. And uh, what I'll do is I have two case studies that I'll detail for you. And I also have the results of a survey uh, which detailed uh, how these rules of thumb can be applied on the ground internationally uh, taken by MPA managers. So next slide, please. These case studies that I'll go through with you are drawn from a larger pool of 15 marine connectivity case studies that you can see in blue here in this image. And they're all available on this online interactive Globescapes map. Uh, in green, you can see the corridor case studies that were included in the IUCN guidelines for uh, corridor conservation. And I highly encourage each of you to access this resource to gain a better understanding of these case studies because each and every one of them is so different and you'll likely be able to find one or two that is relevant to your work. Um, and then to take the lessons learned and the rules of thumb uh, used to, to integrate into your own work on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. There might be a little lag. Zach, are you there? Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, sorry, Mary. There does seem to be a lag. Um, it's so okay. You can hear me. We'll, 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 they might just take wait some time. a second, but it's up now. Um, so first, we'll take a look at a local conservation effort in Belize which has found success in taking a source to sea or ridge to reef approach and uh, also a collaborative approach to conservation. You can see here that a large landscape of protection spans from the Port Honduras MPA up into the Maya Mountains and these protections cover 75 percent uh, of the defiant space. In this area, threats to the marine environment include unsustainable fishing and also land-based pollution, mainly from ag agricultural runoff. Now, the, to combat these stressors, the design and management of this corridor area represents best practices from rules of thumb 7 and also rule of thumb 13. So within Rule of Thumb 7, it states that a multi-management approach is needed across realms. Here, protections have been designated across realms, water to land. And there also happens to be, importantly, a multi-management approach uh, going on that spans these zones. So a local NGO, NGO called Toledo Institute for Development and Environment, or TIDE, uh, was granted co-management of the Marine Reserve with the Fisheries Department of Belize for the Marine Zone, and then also with the Forest Department for those terrestrial zones. And in addition to that, they also manage 
20,000 acres of private protected land as well. So what this group does is they add a local dimension to what traditionally is a government role and they can do this across these environments to provide alignment and decrease those land-based um, sources for threats. Uh, so on to rule of thumb 13, the, it, it strongly comes into play here and it states that um, some of the CBD design criteria that Bard mentioned before, um, including that all work should minimize adverse impacts on existing users and cultural values. So Tide and their community partners do this by largely emphasizing sustainable livelihoods, like transitions from cattle pastures towards um, shaded cacao farms. So overall, what we have here is a network of cross-realm protection governed by a multi-management approach that takes on close consideration and collaboration for success and sustainability of local livelihoods. Next slide. So on this second case, I wanted to scale up a bit to provide a more regional approach to what connectivity conservation can look like. Uh, what we're looking at here is the Eastern Tropical Pacific where complex and interconnected currents influence migrations and movements and distributions of uh, marine species that are really important like tuna and shark and uh, sea turtles and also marine birds. And the threats to these species in this environment um, include overfishing, unsustainable fishing, including uh, bycatch, the threat of bycatch. And now to combat these stressors, protection design has represented best practices um, that are present within rules of thumb 10 and also rule of thumb five. So rule of thumb 10 emphasizes international cooperation as essential to establishing successful ecological corridors and management plans. Here in, the, in this region, a group called the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor or CMAR is a voluntary regional cooperation mechanism between the coastal states of Ecuador, Costa Rica, Colombia, and also Panama for aligned sustainable management of the regional waters. And CMAR navigates coordinated approaches despite distinct cultural, political, legal, and economic systems of these different member states. So essentially, these man-made boundaries and different governance mechanisms splits these waters apart, while CMAR, the regional cooperative, acts to aligned practices across these boundaries for marine purposes, marine conservation purposes. So rule of thumb five is also represented here and it states that management units should scale, should be scaled based on realistic connectivity patterns um, and also incorporating best available scientific information. So if you look at the left hand image here, um, this is a visual that represents the movement of an array of species that were tagged and tracked. And thanks to the scientists who conducted this research, uh, these real connectivity patterns have influenced the MPA design in this region. Uh, most notably and uh, somewhat famously now in the past few months, the Cocos Galapagos Swimway which is now shown in red as a unimplemented but designated zone is um, 
you know, a direct result of mapping these species movements over time. So this scientific ammo is what strengthening cooperation for swimway protection across Ecuador and Costa Rica needs for, for effective protections. And so what we're looking at overall here is sound and up-to-date science that creates regional and cross-boundary cooperative mechanisms and that enables more effective management for these species, um, especially through swimways that go across borders. Next slide, please. So in an attempt to find out more information from those working on the ground around the world, after we published the marine connectivity rules of thumb, we decided to create a survey and we sent this survey out to eight MPA networks internationally um, who disseminated to their, um, to their network members. And it asked questions about each of the 13 rules of thumb, but also questions about barriers and about areas that we don't know much about currently. And some of the key take takeaways from that are that uh, out of those who took the survey, 77% implied that um, the rules of thumb could be implemented where they work. And also that there was an increase in use of marine connectivity practices from 11% up to 49%. And so this is a case, this is a large case to use to further the advancement of the marine connectivity field. Um, lack of knowledge to implement and also lack of funding were two of the largest barriers that were reported for implementing these rules of thumb. And that's going to help us uh, uh, guide us in our next step for hosting webinars like this to spread the word, but also to try to develop tools that support diverse and cross-boundary sources for funding. Um, and of course, it's important to know that cooperation is hard. It takes some time, but um, hopefully with these resources, that can be made easier. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to give Barb the stage again. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Let's have our final little um, segment here, focus on policy, because until these scientific and management principles can move into the world of government policy and law and procedures, it is not always the case that they will be implemented. Mostly execution requires authority. So let's go to the next slide. Now, to start with, we're dealing with the global oceans. And many of you know that we do not have uh, yet, although there is negotiation, a global mechanism for dealing with conservation uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas in the view of some people. Now, as I mentioned, uh, these negotiations are ongoing. They've been going on for two and a half years. Um, they're still con uh, scheduled to continue, but one of the, I'm sure, one one of the challenges is to work with all of the uh, organizations that you see on the right hand side that deal with the sea in different respects, um, different capacities, different interests, and also different constituents. So this is a challenge. And it's a challenge that everyone is trying to work through to make sure we can have MPAs in the high seas. Next slide. Now, we do have 
taking another cut at international law and agencies, we have a significant number of instruments. Maybe we can go back there. Thank you. Um, instruments that can be used positively to support connectivity. And increasingly, these instruments are, all, are already including uh, connectivity into their elements to be considered. And the, this, you know, one of the issues is the lack of knowledge. These, these organizations and their secretariats are fonts of knowledge for what's going on in the ocean and, and are important sources depending on what your requests are. So let's go on to the next slide now. So here, um, just to get, give an example of a couple of areas where international policy, current and within the last year or so, has started to recognize connectivity. We have um, a number of examples here. You can uh, look at them at your leisure. The post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework is one of the, the key ones, which is now uh, including um, language to ensure well-connected systems of protected areas. And then the High Seas uh, Treaty um, Working Group is still um, working diligently to, to move forward a conservation um, treaty that's uh, connected to the Law of the Sea Convention to uh, deal with marine biodiversity and marine protected areas. Next slide. Now, when we have international law or regional law, it needs to be implemented at the national level. And it's not only marine protected areas law and regulations that we need to be looking toward. I wanted to just briefly highlight additional tools. And these are tools that you will find explained at length in many publications, including the couple that I mentioned below. So what do we have? In addition to MPA laws, we have sector laws. And these could include, of course, laws on biodiversity conservation, um, wetlands, uh, energy development, um, seabed mining. These kinds of laws are going to be in most uh, national systems. Then we have the tool marine spatial planning. And, and in addition, because the marine environment is an environment that comes under development, particularly when we're thinking about mining, um, exploration and exploitation, these laws and concepts and, and planning concepts are also important to look at in terms of how we can incorporate connectivity. Then there are voluntary conservation agreements. Some of you may be working with communities, for example, who have rights to much uh, to a certain fisheries area. And having voluntary conservation agreements with these communities can help ensure their practices are are keeping uh, in a format where connectivity is recognized. Finally, economic and market-based instruments. Uh, there we know you have subsidies and uh, disincentives as well, and these should be taken into account. Next slide. Finally, I want to mention that the um, issue of funding has not been focused on as much as should be, particularly from the investment side. And what I wanted to do here was to show um, sort of a new 
movement that is beginning where investors are interested in conservation investing. And you will see in the, in the box at the right, of course, uh, the foreign investors that are part of large institutional investing um, uh, companies, as well as corporations, and then philanthropy and even the big development banks. Some of, you know, all of these have investments in addition to, uh, in the case of philanthropy, uh, grants. So uh, just to keep this in mind, because uh, a, a, a top message in IUCN and its, in its Global Oceans Program is that most existing MPAs do not have enough human and financial resources to properly design and implement conservation and management measures, including connectivity. Okay, next slide. So this is our last slide now, and we just wanted to, to summarize a little bit because it's always important to think about what we all can do. So quickly, by the bullets, if you have not already become part of the working group, please consider joining the working group. You do not need to be a marine scientist. You could be an interested marine student or person interested in the marine environment in general. If you, if you have already become a member, make sure you share your work. Um, be part of the network, exchange research, publications, and findings as well as questions. Then partner, the third bullet, partner with each other on, on testing the application of rules of thumb and, and other practices on the ground. Uh, share your marine connectivity resources with other disciplines and make sure that includes policymakers. And then, as I had just mentioned in the prior slide, promote conservation investments from a diversity of funding sources. Next slide. That is our presentation. These are our contact. Uh, is there contact information resources that I think also Mary is going to put up in the chat um, and you will have it on the slide so last slide uh, thank you Barbara. Zach, Zach can you can you put one more slide up yep sorry there you go Thank you everyone for listening, participating, and I hope we have some interesting questions that we can all go through together. All right, thank you, Barbara, for a great presentation. So I would encourage any attendees, we have a few minutes for questions, so please put any questions that you might have in the questions box, which is located on the <clears throat> control panel that you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can just type your question in that question box and I will see that question and pose it to Mary and Barbara. So we do have one question that came in earlier related to when uh, Barbara was talking about some of the statistics for how much of the ocean is already protected asking if we have any idea of how close we are to that 2030 goal when we take out some of these paper parks, these uh, parks that might not have any enforcement. So do you, either of you have any anything to mention related to that, any resources that we might be able to point that person towards? Well, I, I can mention that the database uh, that we refer to um, through IUCN gives us the latest statistics. The, the effort to try and have marine protected areas in the ocean, no take zones is the challenge because 
different countries will define their MPAs, but allow some fishing um, and and other other activities. The um, the World Protected Area Database, uh, which is managed by IUCN and also I think by the World Commission uh, WCMC, um, will monitor the latest information and always record what they receive. What they receive depends on what the uh, country sends. So at this point, we don't have any um, clear indication down the road about the 2030 um, goal, although we're hopeful that the 30% will actually get through uh, the conference party. There's also an increasing body of protected area management effectiveness tools called PAIM. And not every protected area is assessed on those guidelines, but um, increasingly more are because it takes some capacity to do so. Great points. Uh, next question asks, is there a natural resources or ecological economics component in the, to, in the marine connectivity network approach? Um, Part of the part of the connectivity rules extend to the implications for economics and for society. So you have it's you have the science of planning, and planning must include um, stakeholders and communities uh, that are concerned. Um, governance. And governance is then moving us into um, the social and the economic uh, world of, of connectivity, and then um, the communication across all all those aspects. Um, definitely, the social and economic uh, considerations for how one can apply connectivity effectively becomes a major issue, and when connectivity is in the design process that's where it's particularly important to involve affected stakeholders uh, local communities and those who might have um, the need for a voice in order to make sure it can be implemented mary i don't know if you have anything yeah thanks barb i would also add that um as you know, valuation of ecosystem services on coasts and in oceans develop. Um, I know that's a fastly developing field in the past two years and will come out in the next few years being more prevalent than it was in the past, that integrating that with connectivity and whether a system is connected or not, we'll be able to see the crossovers for economic benefits of connected systems versus not connected systems but i believe that to be something that we will be looking at in the future as as those tools develop thank you unfortunately we're almost out of time but i do want to grab the question that asks how someone can go about joining the marine connectivity working group uh, you mentioned joining it but how does someone go about joining that group Okay, on our uh, contact page, there is a link to uh, the um, large landscape, large conservation landscape um, organization, and they are the secretariat for the Marine Connectivity Working Group. Maybe we can, um, can we go back to that slide? Uh, yes, in one moment, I need to pull it back up. It's not difficult to join. Um, if you are already a member of the World Commission on Protected Areas, since this working group is within 
that umbrella, um, you just have to send in uh, your request and there'll be a little bit of a, a form and you're, you're go you, you will join. Now, let's see. I would say, uh, Mary, I would say it's the, the first, the first link is the best, right? Yeah, so in terms of joining the Marine Connectivity Working Group, I would say the most direct uh, way to reach out would be either to myself or to Aaron Lahr. And because as the secret, as managing the secretariat of the group, we'll be able to integrate you into the system and get you on base camp and get you updated with everything you need to know. Um, but the website, We'll give you more information as well. So I encourage you all to access that. And there's also all of these resources available, whether you're part of the group or not, it's all out there for the public. Um, we want it to be available. We wanna have open communication. So the working group is, is a more internal framework for discussion and for knowledge sharing. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, so I do want to thank Barbara and Mary for the fantastic presentation. And I hope you all learned a little bit more about the marine connectivity rules of thumb and how you can apply connectivity to marine protected area management. So with that, thank you for attending, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Barb. Thank you.